Hi, everybody. Welcome to Community Conversations. Very glad to have you here, both for our in-person audience as well as for our audience on Zoom. Shout out to the Zoom folks. Um, we have a cool event that is coming up next week, and I'm so glad that Alex is here so he could tell me a little bit more about that. Next week, we're going to have the LCC debate team, the Fighting Smelt, go Smelt, uh, having an exhibition debate. So we're gonna see what they do in their award-winning work as a debate team here at the college and beyond. They travel around and win awards, and they're going to be debating whether LCC should change its mascot. I'm intrigued. Um, all right, so come back next week and you can hear more about that. But in the meantime, we have Heidi Bauer here. Heidi Bauer has been teaching English at Lower Columbia College for 13 plus years. I think this is slightly out of date. It might be 14 now. Some of her favorite books include Cheryl Strayed's Wild and Henry David Thoreau's uh, Walden. And books like these have inspired her to take long walks in the woods and inspired her to simplify her own life and to hike accumulated 431 miles along the longest hiking trail from Sisters, Oregon, all the way to Cascade Locks. She is here to share poetry with us of all sorts of natures, I believe. Please welcome Heidi Bauer. Thank you. Uh, you can all hear me okay? Perfect. Um, I'm going to start by just diving right into reading this Maya Angelou poem. And then I'll work backwards and talk a little bit about why I chose this poem and some of the um, interesting and troubling things that I found when I was choosing it. So it's called Phenomenal Woman. Pretty woman, wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size, but when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. I walk in a room just as cool as you please and to a man the fellows stand or fall down on their knees. Then they swarm around me, a hive of honeybees. I say, it's in the fire of my eyes and the flash of my teeth the swing in my waist and the joy in my feet. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, it's in the arch of my back, the sun of my smile, the ride of my breasts, the grace of my style. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't sh shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say, it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care. Cause I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. So I taught a fall quarter, a class called Women Writers. And it was the first time I had taught this class and I let the students choose what literature and poetry they wanted to read for the class. And they selected Maya Angelou. And Maya Angelou's poetry actually isn't as familiar to me as some other poetry is. So I went into po poetryfoundation.org, which I have the link here. And I thought I would choose, um, yeah, I would let poetryfoundation.org do the choosing for me, what poetry they thought was particularly important for her. And then I didn't want to come in just on the strength of the poetry. I also just wanted to read a little bit about Maya Angelou and get a sense of why her literature is important so that I had that to share with the class. And I figured poetryfoundation.org was a great place to start, right? So I'm reading along and a lot of this is about her biography and about her autobiographies because she's most famous for her autobiographies. Um, so it took me a while to get to her, um, the indications about her poetry. 
And when I did, this is what I read. There's two different paragraphs. This was the first one. So Angelo was also a prolific and widely read poet and her poetry has often been lauded more for its depictions of black beauty, the strength of women and the human spirit criticizing the Vietnam War, demanding social justice for all than for its poetic virtue. <laughs> and I stopped for a minute and I'm like, did poetryfoundation.org just call Maya Angelou a bad poet? Because I think that's what it did there. And that was kind of troubling to me, right? And I was like, okay, okay. So we get it, her autobiographies are kind of her strengths. But then I you know, kept on reading to see what else it was that they said about her poems. And among other things, she read an inaugural poem at Bill Clinton's um, inauguration. So that was pretty cool. Um, but then I got to, there's another bit on her poetry. There it is, here. Angela's poetry often benefited from her performance of it, right? So you can go onto YouTube, you could see Maya Angelou perform her poetry. Um, Probably I should have let her perform that poem for you, but you know, deal with it. Uh, and during her lifetime, Angela recited her poems before spellbound crowds. Indeed, Angela's poetry can be traced back to African American oral traditions like slave and work songs. And I got troubled again because poetryfoundation.org seems to have forgotten that it just told me that this was bad poetry. And then I come a little, you know, and then it tells me that she, you know, it was good enough for Bill Clinton. And then I get to this paragraph and I see that her poetry is from a long line of African-American oral traditions. And it's like, are you, are you racist? Poetryfoundation.org? Are you telling me that Maya Angelou's poetry is not good poetry because it falls in an African-American oral tradition like slave and work songs? Is that what you're telling me? And this, this was really troubling to me. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe I'm biased, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's me, not them, right? So I took it to my class and I thought, I will just give them these pieces out of context and, and, and just see how they react. And it was kind of validating, they reacted the same way. And then I asked them, well, okay, so what is poetry? So that we can work from what is poetry to what is good poetry. And that was kind of a mean question. It was a it's fall term. Some of these are first year college students and I'm asking them to define an entire literary genre. And it was two, three weeks in, right? So this was not a kind thing for me to ask of them. So I thought, we need to um, get some more context here so that we can return to this question. And so the talk I'm giving today is a modification and revision of the lecture that I gave to them because we were working together to figure out what makes good poetry so that we could come back to this critique of Maya Angelou's poetry and see at minimum why it was made. Um, and I was more interested in the why than I was interested in whether poetryfoundation.org was wrong or right. And that's my own personal take on a lot of the questions that I ask in life. So when I came back to the class, I, I, or even just thinking about it as I was preparing to come back to the class, I realized the first thing I needed to ask myself is what real poetry has. And it seemed like the the best way to explore this question was go, to go back to the older stuff, right? When, when men were men and poets were poets, right? So I was thinking about um, a lot of the characteristics of older poetry. And there's a phrase that I find particularly useful when talking about poetry. It's one that I stole from Joe Green, who's a well-published poet in his own right. Um, a very skillful poet. And he also used to teach creative writing here. And he used to say that poetry um, needs to be economic, e economical with its words. It has to have a machine that carries the message. So a big difference between poetry and prose generally is that poetry relies on sound and the appearance of the words on the page and to carry that message. So the use of sound and imagery and even figurative language, metaphor, things like that. 
they, you can load a lot of content very economically onto your words, which is good because poetry is supposed to be very sparse with its use of words. And then you also have that um, freedom to break your lines wherever you want. Really, that's the biggest difference between poetry and prose. And I find that idea of the machine carrying the message is a really useful shorthand. And then if we're thinking about the types of machines that you see a lot of with poets from previous centuries, uh, I've got, so these are the machines over here. And then this is the poem that I'm gonna show you how they might work here on the right. So there's a lot of stresses and stress is just the beat of the poem, right? And then rhyme, most people know. You have assonance and alliteration, and those are just the repetition of sounds. I don't know why somebody decided that consonants and vowels each got their own term. Alliteration is the repetition of consonant sounds. Assonance is the repetition of vowel sounds. There's the repetition of sounds. So that you've got the beat, you've got rhyme, you've got the repetition of sounds. And then you've got cacophony and euphony, which are some of my favorite prosodic devices. Cacophony is the use of harsh sounds and euphony is the use of sweet sounds. And then you have imagery. So real poetry for centuries at least, think Shakespeare if you want, had a lot of prosody. And then re real poetry also had an, a message with a capital M, right? So you couldn't just write about, oh, I don't know, it's a lovely spring day. Spring has to mean something, right? It has to be a metaphor for something grandiose, you know, some sort of you know, message that's gonna help you figure out how to live your life. So one of my favorite poets when I'm trying to explore how you know, traditional poetry has worked is Anne Bradstreet, just because like a lot of poets in her time, she really lays it on thick. She's one of the earliest American poets, 1600s. So eh, the English probably claim her too because we weren't a country yet, but she was a Puritan living here in the 1600s. And this is just an excerpt. Her poem, As Wary Pilgrim, is much longer than this. But the, the gist of the poem is this. Um, life is rough. Life is tough. Um, this really stinks, man. I was trying to say that without profanity. This really stinks, but hooray, I'm going to die at some point, and then I'm going to go to heaven, and oh, thank God, things are going to be so much better, right? So the, she's a Puritan, so of course she is looking to the afterlife for her, um, for her everything really, because life here is just not, there's nothing redeemable about this life. It's just rough all the way around. And then living here in the six, living in the, in, on this continent in the 1600s, um, you know, no indoor plumbing. It's, it's not an easy life, right? So um, you can see some reflections of the history there too, but mostly the capital M message is don't look to, for, to this life for pretty much anything. Look to God, eventually you'll get your rest. So that's her capital M message. And the part that I've shared with you here is part of the life is rough part, life is rough part because I really enjoy other people's suffering and I find poetry that is dark more interesting. So uh, you've got the life is rough part here. And what I'm gonna do is just kind of show you how she lays it on thick, right? So start, um, if you're starting with the beat, if you're thinking about that concept of the machine that carries the message, the machine at its most basic can really do two things pretty, pretty well, it does two things at, at, at its most basic. One is it places emphasis on the things that the poet wants emphasized. And then the other thing it can do is it can draw connections between things. So for example, if two things get similar consonant sounds, so alliteration, it might be that the poet is wanting you to see connections there. I'm gonna talk more about emphasis with this poem. I've got a really sly, sassy one on the next slide that does more with connections. So again, easy way to think of the machine is carrying the message. Um, all of these elements in some, well, these first three especially, in some way are going to put emphasis on the capital M message which for the first half of the poem is life is rough and it's message with a capital M because it's a, it's a religious message, right? That you'll find your salvation in the Christian God after you die. So don't look for it here. 
So if, as you're listening for the beat, you'll notice that those things that emphasize life being rough often get the beat. So um, I'm gonna try to do this clapping with the mic and ideally I won't break the internet. So is wary pilgrim now at rest. So wary is, has the beat, right? Hugs with delight his silent nest. His wasted limbs now lie full soft. So wasted, um, you know, he's wasted away. That miry steps have trodden oft. So you hear it's got a regular beat, right? The, the dark stuff is coming, I promise. Blesses himself to think upon his dangers, dangers past, his dangers past and travails done, right? So dangers and travails, right? So the, the hard things in life are done. And then again, this is message with a capital M, you'll find your salvation later. So words that get the salvation are all, also getting the beat. I'm just not playing with them right now. But this is my favorite part in the whole poem, right? This is where she really starts to say, life is rough, man. The burning sun no more shall heat, right? So burning sun and heat. Uh, and more get it right and heat nor stormy rains on him shall beat so you've got stormy rains and beat uh, the briars and thorns no more shall scratch so briars thorns more I love that she hits more right in case briars and thorns aren't enough for you more right and scratch and nor hungry wolves at him shall catch so hungry wolves and catch get it too so she uses the beat to really lay it on thick here that, again, just focusing on that first half of the message that life on earth is pretty darn rough. And then if that's not enough for you, and I'm just gonna focus on the last four lines for this next one, she doubles down with rhyme. It's like one of those really irritating friends that you have who tells a joke that's not very good. And then when you don't laugh, they're like, get it? Get, get, no, but you get it, right? So she takes those words that got the beat and she doubles down and also makes them rhyme. So in those last four lines, you have um, heat and beat and then scratch and catch, which also had the stresses. And then if that's not enough for you, right? Super annoying friend. She also doubles down with her use of alliteration and assonance. So if you listen for the W and the B and the ER sounds, those are all, so the W, B, ER, right? Those are all alliteration consonants. And then the A ah and the A ah sounds in terms of assonance, those sounds also um, tend to emphasize earthly suffering. So wary, right? So you've got W and ER with wary. Wary also gets the beat, right? And then rest you know now at rest this pilgrim is dead thank god and i mean thank god right thank the christian god this guy is dead he's finally at rest hugs with delight his silent nest there's wasted right with the w so uh wasted gets the beat and it also gets the alliteration limbs now lie full soft that mary steps have trodden off trodden right uh i mean she could have used any word there right poets have that power but she uses trodden, right? Which gives you this sense that she's, this guy is just plodding along and then it lets her use the, uh, the alliteration, the er. Um, blesses himself to think upon his dangers, right? Er, er, past and tr 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 er, er. My students love it when I do this. And actually this is the best thing about COVID because if you do this enough, you're gonna accidentally spit on the first row and the, ma <laughs> the mask keeps that from happening. So dangers past and travails done. The burning er, 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 sun no more shall heat, no storm. Er, er. I mean, it's her, not me. I'm just pointing out what she's got here. Stormy rains, rains on him shall heat, or beat, beat. Um, the briars er, and thorns no more shall, and there's the ah, right? Shall, al, and, and then here she's doubling down. She's got er and ah, right? Nor hungry wolves at him shall catch. So some of these words get assonance or alliteration and stress and beat, just in case you didn't get it the first two times. And then if that's not enough for you, she then lays it on even thicker with the cacophony. 
So cacophony is short for harsh sounds. Usually with poetry, they use harsh sounds to indicate something unpleasant. Euphony is sweet sounds like, um, oh gosh, uh, Annabelle Lee. Um, well, An Annabelle Lee is a poem. Uh, we loved with a love that was more than a love, I and my Annabelle Lee. All very sweet sounds. That's an Edgar Allan Poe poem, right? And soft, sweet sounds that go with love. Oh, we're so happy now, right? Which is kind of funny considering uh, how dark of a person Edgar Allan Poe is. So cacophony usually goes with harsh sounds. Euphony usually goes with, um, or, or with harsh ideas, harsh sounds, harsh ideas. Euphony, sweet sounds, sweet ideas. Not always the case. I had students once, um, we often then will brainstorm cacophonic words and euphonic words just so that they can nail it. So um, I was like, give me a cacophonic word that's kind of harsh. And they're like, decapitate. And I'm like, yes, that works. Now give me a euphonic sound. And they're like, behead. And I'm like, you people are creepy. <laughs> and I do think you can play that way, right? So if you have sweet sounds with dark imagery, you do create a creepy mood. So if that's your, if that's your jam, it's not Anne Bradstreet's jam. She does cacophonic words on top of stresses, on top of alliteration, on top of rhyme, on top of imagery, which I wasn't gonna talk about too much, but you can see the burning sun and the stormy rains, right? Uh, imagery is pretty straightforward. So I don't usually spend a lot of time talking about it because if you can see it in your head, that's imagery, you're welcome. But she uses cacophony on top of all of those other things, just in case you didn't get it the first four times to really emphasize how awful this um, life is. So burning is pretty actually sweet. But um, heat, right? So the way, um, the way to remember cacophonic sounds, one is cacophony is what it sounds like, right? Cacophony, again, you're welcome for the mask. Um, cacophony is full of fricatives and fricatives are exactly what they sound like, cacophonic sounds, so fricatives. And if you won't remember any of that, all good English profanity is cacophonic. So just use your imagination there and there you are. So you've got heat and then stormy or rains, kind of sweet, but I love this next lines, thorns and scratch and catch, right? So coming back to that, that first question, um, why did poetryfoundation.org think that Maya Angelou's poetry wasn't that good? Well, she certainly didn't lay it on as thick as Anne Bradstreet, right? And for centuries and centuries, good or real poetry, I, I don't even know if we would say good poetry, but real poetry had a, it just layers and layers and layers of prosody. So st uh, stress, rhyme, alliteration, assonance, all of this prosody. So um, Anne Bradstreet is white. And oftentimes when I'm reading her piece, I'm also reading Phyllis Wheatley, who is a slave from the 1700s. And I have um, this short poem by her here. And this does that other thing that I was telling you about where the use of prosody can connect things sometimes in interesting ways. So again, you want your poem to be economical. You wanna be able to load a lot of meaning onto a very small space. That's um, traditionally what good poetry has been. And when I write poetry, it's certainly what I try to do, which um, I struggle with my verbosity. So it's a challenge. So here's the poem by Phyllis Wheatley. I'll read that for you. And then I'm gonna just read you this little uh, bit of backstory here. And then I'm gonna come back and show you how she, uh, Phyllis Wheatley is playing by the same rules as Anne Bradstreet. I don't think that she can work outside of those rules, especially given her station, but um, she does some pretty cool things here that I think are really fun. So what she says here is, um, "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye, their color is a diabolic dye. Remember Christians, Negroes, black as cane, may be refined and join the angelic train. So capital M message, essentially what she's getting at here, which I actually find really heartbreaking is hey, white Christian people, uh, black people can go to heaven too, right? That's, that's her capital M message. And this concept of twas mercy brought me, 
I just want you to contrast this with her bio. Um, she was seized from Senegal, Gambia, West Africa, when she was about seven. Uh, she was transported to the Boston docks with a shipment of refugee slaves who, because of age or physical frailty, were unsuited for the rigorous labor in the West Indian and Southern colonies, the first ports of call after the Atlantic crossing. So it wasn't mercy. She was ripped from her home, right, at a very young age. And she's kind of known for being a sassy poet. I actually really enjoy Phyllis Wheatley. And I've color coded here the, um, the alliteration, the repetition of s sounds and k sounds. You have to be kind of careful when using letters because a letter like C can make different sounds, right? That's, I mean, I promise I know the alphabet. But one of the interesting things that she does here with uh, the use of alliteration and connection so if you start with this sound, she has mercy, right, connected to savior, which makes sense. A lot of people, when they think of Jesus, they think of somebody who's merciful and soul. So all those go together really logically. And then you have some. Now, the some is probably going to be white Christian people, right, who probably would see themselves connected with mercy, soul, and savior. I love that the next sound that we hear is sable. She has, through the use of um, alliteration, put herself in the same category as these um, people who are scorning her. Put herself in the same category as the savior, which is probably a bit transgressive for this time. I mean, I would have to think so because other, why else would she have um, said that it was mercy other than her audience is going to be white people because white people are pretty much the literate people at this time, right? And then down here, you have that S sound continuing with Negroes and uh, Christians. So she's using the S sound to put her in the same category as white Christian people and Jesus. And I think that's pretty cool. And then you see it uh, happening in a really interesting different way here uh, where it almost feels like she's critiquing the Christians and at the same time reminding us that we're all connected. So you have the, the k sound with scorn. And the thing to remember is that poets can use any word they want. There are synonyms, the English language is rich and there are synonyms for anything that you want. And a poet, when a, po um, when a poet is poeting, is uh, you, know, you, you usually, if you're me, you rough out your message first and then you figure out what you want the prosody to do. And then you just start playing with synonyms so that you can have as many words as possible using the sounds that you want. So something like scorn, she didn't have to use, but I love that scorn goes with Christians, right? Emphasizing this judginess of the Christians that she's seeing, uh, but also it goes with color and cane, and I should have emphasized black here too, black. So you have this idea of Christians and cane being connected and there, there, what she's saying here is that, you know, King was the original black person, right? And angelic. So the connect, the way that Phyllis Wheatley uses connections here or uses alliteration and assonance to create connections that are a bit subversive, I find super cool. And if we go back to that question of what is real poetry, real poetry, uh, Phyllis Wheatley is writing real poetry. She's uh, canonized. She's in all the, if you ever uh, pick up a book of early American literature, you're going to find Phyllis Wheatley. So she has been, you know, honored in that way. So if we're looking at people who break the rules of poetry, which happen all the time, poetry, um, Poetry as it's progressed through the centuries has always been a back and forth conversation. Poets will try to do different things either with their content or with their form. And then they're either celebrated in their time as, oh my goodness, look at the amazing thing you're doing, or they're just criticized harshly, right? Uh, we saw this, you, you'll see this with Wordsworth and Coleridge who are two poetic powerhouses, right? If, um, if you do any dabbling in English poetry or romantic poetry, you've probably heard of Wordsworth and Coleridge. So they're most famous for the lyrical ballads and the lyrical ballads, um, you know, they, they both wrote and they're in ballad form, right? Now, uh, a ballad, if you think about 
sea shanty, say. It's the poetic form of the masses, right? It's a lot easier to understand and follow along. I would argue it's narrative driven. So it's a story in oral form, right? Kind of like the um, slave songs, work songs, oral culture that we saw with Maya Angelou. So, we're, uh, and in these ballads, which were the poetic form of the masses, Wordsworth and Coleridge did a lot of critiquing of poverty and the British response to poverty in this time. So 1800s-ish, right? Um, not a historian. If I get my centuries right, I feel pretty proud of myself. So 1800s-ish. So we've moved from 1600s to 1700s. Now we're in the 1800s. So their form and their content are mirroring each other um, in terms of they're really preoccupied with the condition of the masses and especially uh, they're concerned with questions of poverty. So their content is related to these questions of poverty might not be a message with a capital M, right? Um, usually people want poetry to elevate them in some way, at least up until this point. The dirty unwashed masses, that's not elevating. Why are we talking about that? Why are we using poetry to talk about that? And then the form too with the ballad. So you can see that in the critiques uh, from their contemporaries. So people who were writing about them in the time that they were writing. So Robert Southey, who's a poet who um, very interested in what they're doing. Uh, so in his review of the lyrical ballads, Robert Southey wrote that Wordsworth and Coleridge experiment has failed, right? criticizing the poems that they had called ly lyrical ballads while praising the more conventional other poems like uh, Tintern Abbey, which is one of uh, their mo more favorite famous poems that come out of there and is much less ballad -y. So ballad's bad. So we can see that this critique of something that might've come out of oral culture is not new. So that at least we know. And then um, this is from this book here. One might even say that to Southey, the lyrical ballads were not radical enough in their politics, however radical they might've been in their aesthetics. So you've got form and content. He's saying, okay, I'll, I'll give you the radicalization of your message. I like that you're trying to draw attention to issues of poverty, but ballads bad, so radical in their aesthetics, right? Ballads are not real poetry. And then another critic, Richard Mann, takes issue with the two poets for seeking to reform the established codes of literary taste. Ballad's bad. Um, so here on the left side, what I've been saying is um, the ballad form is critiqued and critiqued and critiqued and critiqued, which is kind of fun because now if you study Wordsworth and Coleridge, there's a whole lot of, they're so amazing. And then you, to be smart about it, you just get really specific about how they're amazing, right? So it's kind of fun to see that in their time, they were critiqued for this as well. They were also not only critiqued, but mocked for drawing attention to issues of poverty. So Wordsworth became, increasingly the target, not just of like formal academic critique, but ridicule among those who either misunderstood what he was trying to do or just straight up disapproved of it. And there's a really great example called the burlesque uh, Barham Downs or Goody Grizzle and Her Ass. So that warning uh, at the beginning about some mild poetic, um, mild poetic profanity, it's ass. Um, and the subtitle is, an expression of anxiety that such drivel might yet become the spirit of the age. And the parody is also a good use for some scatological humor at Wordsworth expense. And if you don't know what scatological means, you're about to see it, so. But before we get there, I want to give you an example of one of the ballads so that you can kind of uh, hear what it sounds like. So this is a ballad, it's written by Wordsworth and it's called Goody Blank and Harry Gill. And I didn't project it because, um, partly because I was lazy and I didn't want to copy and paste a lot, but more so uh, a ballad would have been uh, coming out of oral culture, which means you should be able to hear it without seeing it, without reading it and be able to follow the plot pretty well, right? Ballads use a lot of repetition. Um, they have an easy cadence. They're just easy to follow, right? So it seemed like I was honoring the spirit of the ballad also by not showing it to you. So Goody Blake and Harry Gill. Oh, what's the matter, what's the matter? 
What is it that ails young Harry Gill? That evermore his teeth they chatter, 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 chatter still. So you can hear it already, right? Lots of repetition. It's going to be easy to follow. Poor Harry Gill, we don't know why, but the boy is chilly. Of waistcoats, Harry had no lack. So Harry's the rich guy. Remember, they're going to critique issues of poverty, so it's kind of nice to get that established. Good duffel gray and flannel fine. He has a blanket on his back and coats enough to smother nine. In March, December, and in July, tis all the same with Harry Gill. The neighbors tell and tell you truly, his teeth, they chatter, chatter still. At night, at morning, and at noon, tis all the same with Harry Gill. Beneath the sun, beneath the moon, his teeth, they chatter, chatter still. Young Harry was a lusty drover, and who so stout of limb as he? His cheeks were red as ruddy clover, his voice was like the voice of three. And Goody Blake was old and poor. So now we've got our second character, Goody Blake, right? She's going to be our impoverished person. Ill-fed she was and thinly clad. And if any man who passed her door might see how poor a putt she had. All day she spun in her poor dwelling and then her three hours work at night, right? So pointing out, that, that, boot, that bootstraps idea, that idea that if you just work hard, things will work out for you. Goody Blake is working hard. Alas, twas hardly worth the telling, it would not pay for candlelight. This woman dwelt in Dorsetshire, her hut was on a cold hillside, and in that country coals are dear, for they come far by wind and tide. So it's hard for her to heat her hut because coal is expensive. By the same fire to boil their pottage, two poor old dames, as I have known, will often live in one small cottage, but she, poor woman, dwelt alone. Twas well enough when summer came, the long, warm, lightsome summer day. Then at her door, the county dame would sit as any linnet gay. But when the ice our streams did fetter, oh, then how her old bones would shake. You would have said if you had met her, twas a hard time for Goody Blake. Her evenings then were dull and dead, sad case it was, as you may think, for very cold to go to bed, and then for cold, not sleep a wink. Oh, joy for her and when air in winter, the winds at night had made a rout, and scattered many a lusty splinter and many a rotten bough about. Yet never had she, well or sick, as every man who knows her ways, a pile beforehand, wood or stick, enough to warm her for three days. Now, when the frost was past enduring and made her poor old bones to ache, could anything be more alluring than an old hedge to Goody Blake? And now and then it must be said, when her old bones were cold and chill, she left her fire or left her bed to seek the hedge of Harry Gill. Because obviously she's going to take some sticks out of there for her fire, right? Now Harry, he had long suspected this trespass of old Goody Blake and vowed that she should be detected and he on her would vengeance take. You know, as you would if somebody was stealing sticks out of your yard, right? Whatever she has come into her, she deserves it, right? And he on her would vengeance take. And oft from his warm fire he'd go, and to the field his road would take. And there at night in frost and snow, he watched to seize old Goody Blake. And once behind a rick of barley, thus looking out did Harry stand. The moon was full and shining clearly, and crisp with frost the stubble land. He hears a noise, he's all awake. Again, on tiptoe down the hill, he softly creeps, Tis Goody Blake, she's at the hedge of Harry Gill. Right glad was he when he beheld her. Stick after stick did Goody pull. He stood behind a bush of elder. It's kind of creepy. And till she had her apron full. When with her load she turned about, the by road back again to take, he started forward with a shout and sprang upon poor Goody Blake. So he tackles the poor lady. And fiercely by the arm he took her, and by the arm he held her fast, and fiercely by the arm he shook her, and cried, I've got you then at last. Then Goody, who had nothing said, 
her bundle from her lap let fall. And kneeling on the stick, she prayed to God that is the judge of all. She prayed her withered hand uprearing while Harry held her by the arm. God who never out of hearing, oh may he never more be warm. The cold, cold moon above her head, thus on her knees did Goody pray. Young Harry heard what she had said and icy cold he turned away. He went complaining all the morrow that he was cold and very chill. His face was gloom, his heart was sorrow. Alas, that day for Harry Gill. That day he wore a riding coat, but not a whit the warmer he. Another was on Thursday brought, and ere the Sabbath, he had three. Twas all in vain, a useless manner, and blankets were about him pinned. Yet still his jaws and teeth they clatter, like a loose casement in the wind. And Harry's flesh it fell away, and all who lived him say, all who see him say tis plain that live as long as live he may, he never will be warm again. No word to any man he utters, a better up to young or old, but ever to himself he mutters, poor Harry Gill is very cold. A bed or up by night or day, his teeth they chatter, chatter still. Now think ye farmers all I pray of Goody Blake and Harry Gill. So in other words, if somebody is so poor that they need to come to your hedge to take some sticks to warm up um, themselves by their fire, just let them. So that's an example of the ballad that got criticized both for its form and its content. And I couldn't help but also share with you Goody Grizzle and her ass. So um, this is uh, this is like the poetic version of a Facebook flame war, I guess is the way I would call this. So um, this is by Anonymous and Anonymous is writing in the same form, is not sympathetic to the plight of the poor. Oftentimes these poems that mock the lyrical ballads, um, you know, with the, the lyrical ballad, Goody Blake, she, um, Clearly she worked hard and didn't have it coming to her, but this person is essentially, a, a lot of these mockeries will say they had it coming to them. And then they're also a little bit funny. So, Barham Bet Downs or Goody Grizzle and Her Ass, a lyrical ballad in the present fashionable style. One winter at the close of day, her eggs and butter sold, Dame Grizzle took her homeward way amidst the rain and cold. Or barren brown downs of martial fame, her homeward way did pass. Good lack, so poor was she and lame, she rode upon an ass. The patient beast along did creep, a basket on either side, or which the dame her seat to keep sat with her legs astride. The load was great, the load was great, for grizzle, she was big. One basket loaded was with meat, and to other was with pig. The load was great, the road was rough, and much the ass did strain. And I'm pretty sure he's meaning for you to see ass both ways. And Grizzle with a broomstick tough increased the poor thing's pain. It came to pass, it came to pass, O tale of wondrous dole, the goody Grizzle and her ass fell plump into a hole. All in a hole, all in a hole, down, down they tumbled plump, and Grizzle's nose, Alas, poor soul, lay close to Dapple's rump. The ass he kicked, the ass he brayed, the woman loud did squall, for much was Gammer Grizz afraid, and painful was the fall. Oh, woe on woe, for as she lay upon the ass's back, struggling in vain to get away, she heard a dreadful crack. And first she thought that her poor, poor ass was yielding up his breath, and oh, she cried, alas, alas, his death will be my death. And then she thought it was a ghost, now prone on each occasion, to come from Pluto's realms per post and charm the British nation. She thought it was a modern sprite and longed to see it pass. Come ghost, she cried with all her might, come help me and my ass. But ah, it was not ghost nor groan, it was a rumbling roar a kind of broken winded tone she ne'er had heard before. It was, it was, oh sad mishap, the ass in doleful dumps. With a whoop, whoop, whoop and clap, clap, clap was thundering out his trumps. 
not wind alone, alack a day, burst forth at each explosion. Six quarts of half digested hay composed the odorous lotion. An or poor Grizzle's face it blew, an or poor Grizzle's neck. Half choked, she turned herself askew and lay upon her back. Ah, poor, poor afflicted ass. He strained to change his station, but every strain he made, alas, increased his crepitation. In what a plight was Grizzle's mind, the ass her sides did kick, and his eruptions from behind, oh, made her vastly sick. Her patience gone, the poor, poor dame, though much she loved the creature, enraged by fear and pain and shame, off cursed his ventilator. She opened her eyes to look around and look around did she. She opened her eyes and looked around, but nothing could she see. It was so dark, it was so dark that even in the sky of light, oh, not a single spark could Gamma Grizzle spy. The ass he brayed with horrid sound, Dame Grizzle loud did howl. The rain it rattled on the ground, the thunder did it growl. When lo, a heaven directed swain, his mastiff dog before, trudging from Canterbury's plain to Dover's sea laved shore, passed near the spot where Grizzle lay, and eek her ass so strong, a lantern shed its friendly ray to guide his steps along. He saw the hole, he saw the ass, he heard the woman bawl. Not yet unfeeling did he pass, but saved her, ass and all. He led her to a neighboring inn, her drooping soul to cheer. When Grizzle, she got drunk with gin and he got drunk with beer. The jackass too, dear suffering beast, was led into a stall where he enjoyed a, of hay a feast and soon forgot his fall. And still the luckless hole is seen for grass and dapple fell and still the lotion marks the green and still retains its smell. And still is heard in winter hoar when night has banished day for dapple's fundamental roar and eek his fearful bray. And still does pity wander here, her leisure hours to pass, and still relate the wild despair of Grizzle and her ass. For though Dame Grizzle did not die, nor yet her ass so strong, her tale deserves a tender sigh and eek a tender song. I mean, come on, that is so delightful. So this back and forth, it's never ended. It's one of the more fascinating things about literature in general and, and poetry in particular. Um, should it have form? Should it be free? Like what makes real poetry? So Walt Whitman, a lot of folks have heard of him. He, um, he's often called the father of free verse. So that idea that you have to have regular uh, beats in a poem, the idea that you have to rhyme at the end of every line, the idea that every line needs to be the same length. He's, um, I always call him our original hippie dippy poet. He's just like, let it all hang out, man. Just write it as you think it, just write what you feel. That's kind of Walt Whitman. Um, e. e. Cummings, which you can see even by his name, he refuses to follow rules as basic as capitalization. He's most famous for the form his poems takes on the page, but you can see that he's also looking at breaking rules. Um, we were talking about M with uh, meaning with a capital M. Robert Frost is a po poet that a lot of people are familiar with, who a lot of people are familiar with. And his focus is on simple literal poetry. So um, no meaning with a capital M. If he says, um, I am tired after picking apples, he means he went to pick some apples and now he's tired. And then William Carlos Williams with, his, uh, with this poem here about stolen plums, right? This is also in the Norton. Uh, this is also canonized. So uh, William Carlos is William's poem. This is just to say, I have eaten all the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious, so sweet and so cold. That's it, that's the poem. So all of that, right? We've been questioning what poetry is for centuries. We've been questioning what poetry does for century. And poetryfoundation.org wrote that thing that I read to you, or at least um, recopyrighted it in 2022, which is I hear this year. 
they still say that Angela was a prolific and widely read poet and that her poetry has been lauded more for its depictions of black beauty, the strength of women and the human spirit, et cetera, than for its poetic virtue. So as far as I can tell, even with all this back and forth, even if all this questioning of what real poetry is, um, poetryfoundation.org still doesn't seem to think that Maya Angelou fits that mold. I don't know, um, maybe her poetry, maybe it doesn't use enough prosody. Uh, maybe it's the fact that we still don't accept that poetry patterned after African-American oral traditions like slave and work songs are capital P poetry. I don't know if it's maybe that we don't accept that poems that respond to matters like race and sex on a larger and social and psychological scale are poetry. Every poem I read to you so far with the exception of Phyllis Wheatley's was uh, raising issues of class. Now I know there's a lot of poetry out there so that might just be my sample but I did find it interesting that the more famous poets were raising issues related to class and Maya Angelou who's writing now um, is responding to issues of race and sex. Um, maybe we still don't accept that that's poetry, even as we have a long history of these canonical poems. So poems, canonical poems, a group of scholars has accepted that it's poetry with a capital P. Um, we have a long history of canonical poems that explore issues of class. So that was my exploration. And there's a lot of things that I still don't know. I don't know yet if I'm positioned to answer this question, if Maya Angelou's poetry is poetry with a capital P, but I do feel like I'm more confident in understanding why it was that poetryfoundation.org might've thought this. Some of these reasons are more neutral. Some of them could be quite troubling. I do know though that poetry can mean many, many things. And I do know that poetry is beautiful and that it's empowering and that it's mighty. And I do know that understanding contexts like this can help poets like us create that beauty and demand that empowerment, and it can help us embrace our own might. Thank you. So I want to give us a chance to ask a couple questions if we want, and I want to let you bring up the plums. I have to ask, what do you think of the fact that something like the William Carlos Williams poem has been memified and created into all these different iterations in the public discourse, I guess. I have two reactions. One is anytime people enjoy poetry, I am happy. Um, poetry is kind of a hard thing to get into and a lot of people find it very inaccessible. And anytime people enjoy it, I am happy. And I still can't quite bring myself to figure out why it's such an important poem. Um, which I often don't share publicly because I feel like as a, you know, a, a professor of American literature, I should know that, but it just, it feels like it just is well suited to a meme. And if that's the case, why is it a good poem? It's something that I still need to figure out. Maybe that's my next investigation. <laughs> okay, coming over for questions. Uh, hello. Uh, I was wondering, does so poetry should follow the beat of the heart in the in the uh, experience, i.e. in sports, love, death, suspense, and it has to have a yin and yang. And then also, what's the Poetry Foundation's thoughts about Shel Silverstein? If it's as that uh, I'm. I really want to look that up. Um, oftentimes, when I'm teaching poetry or reading poetry, what I tell folks is you are, if you understand what poetry is trying to do, you are well qualified to do that analysis work yourself. And I might be biased because I teach introductory courses and I don't, and I want people to feel as though what they, what they think and what they notice is important and that they don't have to go to the internet to find those answers for themselves or, or to, not for themselves, to find those answers that they probably have that answer for themselves. So I, I don't know what PoetryFoundation.org thinks of Shel Silverstein, um, but I do very much enjoy his poetry. And when I've on occasion taught miniature creative writing classes and I ask folks to bring in uh, poetry that they actually enjoy, Shel Silverstein is 
even though I have traumatic memories of forgetting that I was supposed to memorize one of his poems for elementary school and getting one of the lowest grades that I got in elementary school outside of penmanship. Other than that, I like Shel Silverstein's poetry quite a bit. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Please come back again next week for the uh, Fighting Smelt debate and have a great day, everybody.